So without further ado, I'm going to ask Professor Meeks to bring us greetings. Good afternoon. I begin by introducing the person you were just speaking to, which is Dr. Barbara Carvey, who did introduce herself, <laughs> and who is director of the Disaster, Disaster Risk Reduction Center. Do you call it DRR? DRC. For sure. yes. DRC, for sure. Uh, Dr. Carvey, Dr. David Smith, Dr. Tara Edwards, Dr. Pat Northover, uh, the ladies and gentlemen, all, in particular those of us present who have come, as I understand it, all the way from the Portland, right? Uh, welcome to you who have come from far to the universe and the West Indies and to everybody else, welcome as well. It is my pleasure to bring opening remarks from the Serapolis Institute for Social and Economic Studies, one of the co-sponsors of this seminar and the person of Pat uh, Northover, who is co-chair of the cluster, as Barbara indicated, earlier on. I also want to extend apologies to the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, the third co-sponsor, or the third sponsor, along with uh, our services and the Institute for, for Sustainable Development. Uh, uh, the Dean Evan Bonny Dugan is uh, at our faculty board, where those of us in social sciences should also be, but we, we tee out from the board and come to this meeting instead. And he will be here shortly because as the head of, of as a dean, he can't tip out like us. Uh, the history of the idea behind this thing, I think, goes back to the early days of what we can now call the Goat Islands question, when uh, Pat Northover and I had a discussion on the possibility of a seminar to discuss the entire question, which we thought was, was topically important and one that um, wasn't sufficiently reflected in our work. And we discussed the possibility of doing this with the Institute of Sustainable Development. And Pat, of course, took the ball, ran with it. And here today we have uh, this extraordinarily important research cluster. Now, what is a research cluster? Uh, basically, what we're looking at is a group of people from uh, the University of the West Indies and from its different campuses, but also, hopefully, in the long term, able to work with people in communities uh, with activists with people who are actually doing the work on the ground to discuss a variety of topical issues and to arrive at new approaches through research, through community engagement, to addressing critical problems in our society. Um, certainly what we at Solisas have tried to do is to set up a series of clusters a sustainable rural agricultural development cluster, social policy cluster, a regional integration cluster, a youth cluster, a political economy and public policy cluster. And now uh, today we have this cluster on sustainable investment, environment and development. I'll get to um, say that quickly soon. And we'll find an acronym, don't worry. We'll find a way to say it in short hand, uh, although we haven't quite yes, told it yet. Um, and the aim, of course, is that if we stay up here on the campus, as people are complaining incessantly, and don't connect with community, don't connect with people, uh, it's not that we can't do important work, and have done important work, but there is a way in which that work is a step removed from what people are experiencing on the ground. But more importantly, what we can bring to those debates is our skills, hopefully, that we have them in research, uh, in investigation, and uh, our uh, accumulated knowledge, which we have in particular areas. More importantly, one of the dangers of the academic Cheers. community is that we are, you would think that we are all together talking to each other, we're not. The, the, the medical people are not talking to the geographers, uh, the social scientists are not even talking to each other, much less to the medical people and the geographers. And so we need to find a space in which we can get people together engender debate, connect with the communities where the issues are taking place, uh, and provide uh, new innovative research which will lead to new solutions to social and political questions. From Sir Lises's perspective, 
uh, we want to give maximum autonomy to our fellows, in this case, Pat Northover, to work with our fellow academics, our fellow people in the field, to arrive at solutions across the University of the West Indies and beyond the University of the West Indies. This is the approach we think is the best one to address difficult developmental, and in this case, environmental questions. Um, the one utilized here today, and frankly, the one that should have been used from the very beginning by the government of Jamaica. I don't know why um, the approach of, of, um, of simply sitting with people early in the game, hearing their problems, um, explaining the various things. And there still is room to do that, but we would like to set an example in what we do and how we approach questions that are, are not, there are no simple answers to these questions. And there are real compromises that may very well have to be made in many different ways. But if we begin by a process of conversation, um, then we can perhaps arrive at those answers in a way that are inclusive and that lead to solutions that the entire country can be. So I look forward to your deliberation with great interest as somebody who knows very little about many of the intricate details that have to be discussed. And Salisa's promises to play a supportive role in both the work of the cluster and whatever discussions and decisions arise out of this particular day. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we thank Professor Meeks for his for bringing greetings for us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move directly now into the program. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. In the interest of time, Pat and I are presenting, um, are, I'm presenting on behalf of the two of us. And what we want to start out with is talking about what is the common goal. Why, why, why are we here? What is this all about? And um, development in Jamaica should fit under the heading of the national vision of Jamaica being the place of choice where people should live, work, have raise their families and do business. We're going to talk a bit about the Goat Island debate in terms of where it starts, where it's coming from, in terms of the need for growth in the country, uh, what protected areas are about, and then move on to key issues with regard to sustainable development. As we all know, since we all live here, it's a small island, Jamaica is, it's also a very uh, delicately balanced island, we have had a large number of development challenges and have not grown very much. If you look at the economy of Jamaica over the last several decades, it's characterized by low growth. Um, when things happen outside of Jamaica, whether it be something in the United States or a hurricane passing by, we get hit by it and we get affected by it. There's also, we have very, very high levels of debt, as I'm sure you know, we actually owe way more than we make um, in every year, so it's 140% of our debt, uh, of our national income is actually debt. The dollar is continuing to devalue, and uh. poverty, crime, and so on and so forth are increasing. The government of Jamaica, in trying to address these problems, is seeking to come up with really big ideas and really big projects that should solve the problem. So one of these projects is the idea of the logistics hub which is a series of different things which will be cited on the south coast of Jamaica. The idea being that they will help to really jumpstart the economy of Jamaica and a lot of things will happen. It's a large development project requiring something of the order of seven to eight billion dollars US and it's going to take place over several years in terms of being built. Within that, we've heard about something called the Goat Island Project which has been emphasized over and over, is not the logistics hub, but it is apparently part of the logistics hub, falls under the framework of the logistics hub, but the logistics hub is larger than Goat Island. So it's not just what's going on in Goat Island that we should be concerned about, but what's happening in the rest of the logistics hub as well. The question we want to find out is, well, yes, we need development, we need growth, people need jobs, we need to alleviate poverty, we need to make Jamaica a better place, the questions that we should be asking with regard to development are, is this a solution to that problem? Are the um, ideas of the logistics hub, the Goat Island development and so on, are they actually going to help 
in terms of alleviating poverty and building growth, or not? And also, if they are going to help, is there a cost to that? Nothing comes without a cost. At some point, we have to look at the costs and the benefits and weigh them up. And the idea of doing that is something which we'll be tackling in the course of this uh, discussion. So just to remind ourselves of what the government, through a very inclusive process involving both political parties and lots and lots of um, community groups and civil society came up with as the goal for where we want to be in 2030. We want to have a prosperous economy and we also want to have a healthy national environment. Those are goals three and four, they're right next to each other. So the very least is if you read one, you see that the other one is there. <laughs> so we're looking at things like a strong economic infrastructure, energy security, very important if you pay JPS bills, technology enabled, how can we use technology to make our lives better, internationally competitive industry, a sustainable management and use of the natural and environmental resources which we have, so we don't want these resources to run out, we want them to last well beyond 2030. Hazard risk reduction and adaptation to climate change. Climate change is real, it's happening, it's going to affect Jamaica very, very soon. As a matter of fact, Jamaica is one of the first countries in the world which will be affected by climate change. So we need to be aware of how we're going to deal with that. And there's the whole business of urban and rural development. If you have good rural development, then it stops everybody in country wanting to come to Kingston. And that may be a good thing because Kingston is often not a pretty place to be. So what are protected areas? Protected areas were set up by the government of Jamaica and have been set up by governments all around the world to protect things which they consider to be of value. So the protected area of Portland Bight was established by the government of Jamaica, not by environmentalists, whatever they may be, but by the government of Jamaica because the government recognized that the resources that were there are worth protecting. If you look at this, it's protected because of recognized natural, ecological, and possibly cultural values as well. So there are important things within the Portland Bike Protected Area that are of such value that the government of Jamaica said we need to protect this. And managed by legal means as well as conventions and other things as well. So it's not protected unless you actually pass a law to protect it. But in the case of Jamaica, yes, laws have been passed. Why protected areas? Because they have high biological values, high levels of biological diversity, that is the diversity of plants and animals that may be there. Valuable ecosystem services, things that we use from nature, such as fishing. The ability to produce and make sure that there are levels of fish sufficient to be able to be caught and make money from protecting coastal communities from the sea, watershed protection and management. So in Portland Bight itself, there are mangroves that are nurseries for fish and protect the shore. That's particularly important in the south coast of Jamaica, which as you know has been hit by several tropical cyclones over the last 15, 20 years. Mangroves are very good at protecting shorelines. Forests, where your endangered species of animals and plants may occur, but forests also protect where you get your water from and also protect soil. And there are several government forest reserves within the protected area, Portland Bight protected area. There's also coral reefs and seagrass beds. And these are important because they help in shoreline stability, but also, again, in that whole business of fishing and anything that we get from the marine environment. Seagrass beds are very important. Coral reefs are very important. So, when I say they're important, why do I say they're important? Important to who? The first set of people that they might be important to would be the 50,000 people who live in the Portland Bike Protected Area, among some 49 different communities. So the communities, there's a large number of them, but they're not very large communities. And people who live within those communities are the primary beneficiaries. They are benefiting from the shoreline not being eroded every time the wind picks up and the waves start to to, to bash onto the shore. They are the people who benefit because they can actually go fishing and expect to catch something. 
They are people who are benefiting because they're not being flooded every single time it rains, because there is a wetland system and proper drainage, and there are forests which take care of the soil and cut down on some of the erosion. In addition to that, there are birds, iguanas, crocodiles, manatees, turtles, and fishes, Animals, some of which we use for food, some of which we don't use for food, as well as plants which are beneficial for a variety of different things for their protection, and also because many plants, if you work on them well enough, you can develop medicines from them, and many medicines have been developed from plants. In addition to that, there's agriculture going on there. There's manufacturing, mining, there are two ports, Three sugar estates, well maybe the sugar isn't so important as it used to be, but there is flat agricultural land which is very important and if we can figure out what to grow there, then of course it will become very, very important. Fish farms, a bauxite alumina plant, a couple of power plants as well, so there's a lot going on in the Portland Bike Protected Area, a lot that provides employment for people, a lot of goods and services being provided. It's very important to manage all of that, though, because we don't want it to end up being degraded. It's a large area. Some of it is land, some of it is sea. About 4.7% of the terrestrial area of Jamaica and 47% of the island's shelf. So it's quite a large chunk of what's going on in Jamaica quite a large chunk of our natural resources. That's a map of it, and there was a map up there before, and I think there are maps at the back as well if you need to orient yourself. So what's this sustainable development idea all about? The idea is that unlike what we used to think in the 60s and 70s and so on, we can't continue turning the environment into things that are good for us. We can't continue mining and mining and mining and expect that we will always have things to mine. We can't continue burning fossil fuel and expect that we will always have the fuel and that there is no downside to this. What we realized after many, many hundreds of thousands of years of thinking that we just had unlimited resources is that our resources are in fact limited. Not only that, if we use them up wrongly, and if we distribute the proceeds of our wealth wrongly, then we run into problems. Sometimes, one of the problems is that we don't have equitable development among people within our own generation. So some people are doing very well, and some people are doing really, really badly. And the other problem is that we use up resources which our children will need, which is also a bad thing. The answer to much of this, is, if you ask an economist, is simply that we need more growth. The problem with that is growth really usually refers to the size of the economy that you and I live in. And the measurement for growth often is the amount of gross domestic product divided by the number of people that live in the economy, so you get GDP per capita. Which is a nice average measure, but it doesn't actually say anything about your individual wealth. It's as if everybody, if we were all in a bar, and all of a sudden Bill Gates walked into the bar, that would make all of us richer. Why? Because the average wealth of the people in that bar had suddenly jumped up tremendously. But unless Bill Gates was actually going to be giving us a lot of money, it makes no difference to us. And that's the same problem you have with things like GDP. In addition to that, you can grow the economy and not benefit everybody in the economy. That's something we see all the time. The economy grows, but that doesn't help me. So we need to be able to look and figure out, well, what else can we do apart from growth? We need to look at ways of making sure people have access to opportunities and that we are talking about sustainability. So as I said before, we're talking about a very large system, a lot of things going on, a lot of resources as well, and we need to figure out, well, how are we going to make this system work forever? We don't want it to come to a crashing halt in 10 years' time or before the 20 kicks in. So we need to figure out, well, how do we conserve the ecological functions that are providing the water that we need, for example, or the soils? How do we deal with technology? Technology can help us live better, but how is it relevant to what we're doing in the Portland Bight area? How do we deal with fairness in terms of access to jobs and access to opportunities, access to things like training, for example? We want to be able to 
end extreme poverty and keep our environment working, make sure that people are involved in decisions that affect them, and we want good governance. These are sustainable development goals, the things that everybody decided in Rio the last time they met that all countries are going to now try to pursue. If we want to achieve sustainable development, it's useful to think of four things. Our natural capital, the, the fish, the soil, the water. Our societal capital, our collective actions, how society works together. Do we have good health services? Do we have a good education service? Are you able to get social support when you need it? Human capital. How are you as an individual? Are you healthy? Are you well educated? Are you able to take advantage of the opportunities that come to you? Do you feel good? Are you happy? And economic. What's going on? Is there enough trade and various other things going on to make sure that everything keeps ticking over? You have to have balance across those, otherwise you can't get sustainable development. So we've listed here different things that fall under the different kinds of capital, depending on whether you're looking at nat natural, social, or economic. The important thing, though, is you can't just move things around from one to the next. So if you run down your environmental capital, you can't compensate on that by suddenly increasing your human capital. No matter how well educated you are, if there's no water in the tap, it doesn't help you. So you can't run down one and push up the other. They're not equivalent to each other. And you can't move things around from one to the next, even though we used to think that's what you could do. We were wrong. These are ways in which we can measure these things. But you have to measure all the different kinds of capital and make sure you keep an account of the different kinds of capital you have. If you put in a large development, then what do you do? You need to ask questions about all the different kinds of capital that are there, making sure that when you put in this development, you don't run down one kind of capital and hope that you can replace it with another, because they're not equivalent. So, ecosystem services. What questions are you going to ask about? How would the new development affect water? Is there enough water to run the new development and also run the 50,000 people that are already there? What about fisheries? Are they going to go up or down? What about the protection of our soil and coast? Are we moving mangroves? Are we changing currents? What about clean air? If we put a coal-fired plant there, and it's well known from scientific research taking place in China that there are focuses of cancer around coal-fired plants. Pollution. Ships carry bilge water from all kinds of places around the world, and they dump it in different ports. That's why you have green mussels everywhere. That's, that's not a good thing. The degradation of the services or the removal of the services are things we should be concerned about, because right now we have those services and we enjoy using them. What about flooding, storm surge, wind, spills and accidents, oil spills, or you know, how well are we going to do with those? Biodiversity. Unique or endemic species. When we ask about now, if we talk about our economic values, we talk about jobs. Are the wages good? Are the working conditions going to be good? Those questions have to be asked. Note that the workers who are working on the north-south bit of the highway right now don't think that the conditions are good, so they're not working. What kind of jobs? How many of them? How long are these jobs going to last? Where is the revenue going to go? Is the government going to get it? Is money going to actually come into the country? Most hotels, that, they don't do that. What kind of energy are we talking about? Is there going to be an opportunity for local people to supply goods and services? Is the new thing that you build going to compete with existing livelihoods? Are you going to have to import labor, goods or services? Are you going to increase or see an increase of things that were there before because now there's increased demand? People are going to need to be educated to provide the skills that whatever you build comes in, but will they have access to education and training so that the skills they don't have can be acquired so they can get the new jobs? We mentioned health and pollution already. We also need to ask questions about those jobs. Are they going to be decent jobs? Will there be job security? Will there be upward mobility? How will the new development affect things like crime, education, training? Are we going to be involved in decision making? What about the accommodation and the housing needs or the transport needs for all these new people that are going to be working there? Are they going to just suddenly set up shop anywhere and then impinge on the people who were there before? What about social conflicts between the people who are now coming in and the people who were there from a long time? 
All these things need to be put together and weighed and, if possible, measured so that you can quantify the impacts and say, are the costs X? Are the benefits Y? How do we look at the difference between the costs and the benefits? If the costs are much larger than the benefits, then you probably shouldn't proceed on the project. What we're going to talk about now is what are the costs, how would you measure the benefits, how would you measure the costs. Thank you. I'm very pleased to introduce Ms. Ines Williams, who is going to speak to us about some of the concerns of the Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I did not have, if you do notice, I don't have a paper right now. <laughs> Reason why, I am going to speak the truth and just the truth. <laughs> the things that affect us and the things that worries us. I am here from Portland Cottage, which is in the dead south of Clarendon, dead south of Jamaica, and we are surrounded with the Caribbean Sea and three sides of the community. I am here to speak on behalf of the people of Portland Cottage because we are unfairly treated. <coughs> this Go Thailand project comes up and we didn't hear anything about it, only on the news we say Go Thailand, Go Thailand. I remember Miss Diana McCauley, we went to a meeting in the, in, I think it was in Kingston or Portmore area, Miss Parchment, Mr. Brandon A. We did not get a chance to speak up. Every time we put up a one, they went to somebody else. So Portland County didn't get the access to speak on the things that affect us. During Hurricane Ivan, we were <coughs> flooded out, lost, lost of lives, both human and animals, and also went down. We did not have a problem before come concerning storm surge or anything like that. But a few years before, um, Jamalco had a dredging, and you know, the deeper the water, the higher the wave. And so, Portland Cottage started experiencing storm surge. Now, Go Thailand is about to take place, and we know that it will be greater dredging, deeper. So, what will happen to the people of Portland Cottage? Are we being, going to be treated like the, little, the two little lizards that Mr. Omar Davis speaks at the news? Because I watch news. I watch news because I want to know everything. I'm going to be treated like them. I hear him, rip, him speaking about diversion of fish. How can he divert fish? How will Mr. Omar Davis do that? Next, I am thankful to you, Ms. Parchment, because it is because of CCAM where we get privilege that we can go to training and learn a lot of things. Before that, we didn't have a chance to speak to anyone. So everything comes to us, we have to accept it. I am thankful to you for those training that we get and we could speak to her, our concern, the things that affect us, the things that worry us. And I think she's the person who speaks to Ms. Schillingford. I'm grateful to you, Ms. Schillingford, for listening and for coming out to Portland Cottage, bringing in your team, hearing our growth and our concern. And today we could be here to speak up on the things that is affecting us. I think Gold Thailand should be a no-no. It should be a no-no. If they're really concerned about the people of Portland Cottage, or the surrounding areas, I think it should be a no-no. Don't just think about the money that they will be getting, but think about people's lives. We are gods and made, and I think all of us should be treated equally. If Mr. Omar Davis or anyone else were living in Portland Cottage, would they, uh, would they give that consent for Goat Island to be dredged, to use as a logistic hub? No. There are so much things that will affect us. I hear Mr. Simmons speak about the water that will follow the, the oil that will be leaking from the ship and all other things. It will affect us. And I want them to know that we really need for them to listen to our concern and stop what they are doing. Thank you.
I'm very pleased that Ms. Williams was able to be here to address us and also the support from the community as well. So next we have Ms. Aldine Schoenford. Exploring development in Port and Cottage results from a participatory research project which our um, class of um, level three BSc social work students carried out. Uh, the course that they were taking was community organization and we also want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Helen Fox and Mr. Richard Leach of the Derrick Gordon Data Bank for helping us with some urgent um, requests for assistance in terms of analyzing the demographic data that we were getting. Development has been acknowledged as a process of learning leading to empowerment through people participation. I'm glad that I'm hearing some of that in the background today because that's where we begin from. And this can be facilitated by a, a, an approach that we use called participatory learning and action, which enables people to become part of the development process. If we are working with people, then we have to have a research methodology that is going to be, help us to begin to engage persons. It is also... Which one is this? No, I'm going back. <coughs> right. Part of this development and uh, participatory research came out of our relationship with the CCAM organization. And, um, oh, I see what is happening. What I'm putting here? Okay. Right. And, hold, and for them, it was uh, this relationship developed because both of us were interested. Um, we had mutual um, requests. The students needed to do an assignment. Goat Islands was <coughs> one of the contemporary issues and we wanted to visit the communities because of that. So we made contact with CCAM and for them, it was all about how the Goat Islands project might impact those who reside in the community. And it was also about what then are the capacities that are needed if the community is to participate in development decisions concerning the community. So we went in based on um, those questions. Those were our questions. We did a, what we call a rapid participatory research over two days. We spent three hours one day, two hours another day. And of course, um, that included, by the way, some cross-sectional transit walks through five areas of the community. We selected five areas in Portland Cottage itself. Um, Port, it, 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 there was Board Scheme, Portland Beach, Shearer's Height, and Freetown. We interviewed 67 persons in five districts. And included were two groups, a features group and a women's for action group. Sorry, I'm the whole process of this um, of, of carrying out the research called a community pro we were trying to it is called a community profile, which I'll tell you a little bit about later on. Um, but the whole process involves doing some of the groundwork, building a relationship with the community, gaining entry, and entry was not just driving in and driving out, but sort of it involves the whole process of getting approval for the work that we are coming out there to do, and also to motivate the community's participation in this research. And we don't do this unless we have a committee of persons, and so if we didn't have one, we would have set up a steering committee other than that we had a committee of persons who we worked with, CCAM and um, the women's group. Then we did a research design, the class had to prepare. It was preparation of the team and developing the kind of objectives, who are the groups you're going to be interviewing, what are the kind of methods you'll be using, the tools and techniques of the PLA. And then all of this takes place prior to implementation of the actual research process and decision making. Uh, the data analysis, which is what we are doing now, and later on, we talk about action planning. Limitation of this really is that we haven't, um, we, it requires sharing the report and the analysis and the recommendations of validation by the community. We haven't had to do, we haven't been able to do a lot of this. We had one session in the community where we presented all the diagrams 
that were done and the analysis done by the community and they turned out, but we really would have liked to have done a wider, um, valid, had a wider validation done, but the intention now, that's where we're going with this later on. <clears throat> the key concepts, a community profile presents data about the neighborhood as a whole and it includes both, um, it can be used as a source um, to monitor the community it can be used as this baseline data, but it includes both hard and soft data and information from statistical departments. So we get, that's what I was trying to put together why I had difficulty getting the, in, the, the, the report out to person. So I was trying to get through to the pop, exact population size, poverty data, employment, and so on. The profile it says is a process of empowerment and capacity building, which enables an understanding of the nature of the community, its resources and problems, and in determining actions to aid problem resolution. Oops. Oops. And our key concept we're talking about is capacity, which includes really the motivation, the commitment to be able to organize and utilize your resources and to understand and to analyze your problems and skills to be able to solve those problems. The, here's a map of the, uh, the, which we saw, I think a similar map was up, just to give you a map of the area that we're talking about. Portland Cottage is where those two are here, so it's around these communities that we, we actually um, selected persons from. The physical profile, now please bear in mind that this is coming from persons in the community themselves, right? So they are now given all of this information from the people's perspective. They spoke about limestone forests on the Portland Ridge, mangrove wetlands, two small fishing beaches, natural harbors and bays offering sanctuary to wildlife, coral reefs, road network um, identified as poor and inadequate. So uh, uh, due to uh, the, uh, the lack of attention given to proper drainage. Um, the demographic data which we got from help from Christine Foxley spoke of population, the population of 2,668, almost equal, 50-50 male, female, 747 households predominantly headed by men, unusual, 63%. Population is young. 44% aged um, below 18, 12% aged 18 to 24. 32% of heads and uh, of household educated to the primary level, 61% to the secondary level, 2% at the tertiary level. And we have a dependency ratio of 45. The map here is, for example, our first engagement, getting people comfortable with what we are here to do. So the first thing you, one of the first things we ask for is a map. Everybody gets down to doing a map. And it is from the map that we can begin to probe and interrogate, where is this, what is this? And all those sorts of questions are, are, are asked. And so the communities recall so far about its history. They told us that the community is more than 100 years old. They mentioned port because it was a very important port and land, the word land was added on later on. Uh, they told us of a president visiting um, the Goat Islands somewhere in the 1940s. It was true. Peter S. Fields recall of this is that in 1941, President Roosevelt did go to the Port Islands where um, there was an agreement between the, the, the Great Britain and the United States for there to be a, a, a naval station set up mm -hmm. on the Goat Islands. Their, the history also spoke about their experiences with storms and hurricanes, which Ms. Annie spoke with, so spoke about impact increasingly severe. Hurricane Ivan, 2004, six people were killed, 500 houses lost. Their roof, 80 houses completely da uh, destroyed. Um, damage blamed on the first dredging, as she spoke of. I'm not sure now whether it's in the harbor, in the seas, but a dredging activity did occur. Significant damage to businesses, churches, crops, roads, shorelines, freestanding coral reefs and mangroves, and then Hurricane Dean in 2007 destroyed homes, schools, and livestock. Economic profile, 
fishing, farming, and pole burning were main areas of self-employment for men. Men also employed as cane cutters, plant and machine operators, assemblers, construction and craft workers. Women involved in farming and rearing of animals, small business including commercial shops, cook shops, housekeeping services, and some of them worked in a coffee factory in Tarrington. They spoke about the negative effects of employment in the bauxite sector due to the downsizing at the Jamaica plant. They spoke about the Monument Sugar Factory, now known as the Pan Caribbean Sugar Company, recently sold to a Chinese company. A large number of workers made redundant, only a few were re employed. And of course, out of this, we are also hearing some feelings of distrust regarding the Chinese company. So then, who then are the organizations? What is the capital that is available out in Portland Cottage? We looked at who were the, uh, the organizations that they spoke of, and they also mentioned some key elites. Fishers Group, Farmers Group, Women's Group, Portland Cottage Citizens Association, these are all the active ones, and of course the SECAM agency, which um, is affiliated with all of them. They also named some business persons, pastor, person who headed food for the poor, justice of the peace, as persons who they had a close relationship with. And our next slide will show you some of that. We give them a, uh, we, we, we have something called a Venn diagram where they have to put up their relationships. Who are the persons that they have relationships with in the community, persons or organizations. And the placements of these circles are critical because it's the main circle represents the community, and the other smaller circles represent the agencies and our individuals. And the closer they are to the circle, the stronger the relationship. So you can look and see where, if you're on the line, it means you're tentative. <laughs> if you're inside the circle, it's a strong relationship. If you are outside, um, you can interpret that one. So you can see who is in and who is out. <laughs> right. Here's, a, here's another one, not as clear as the first one, but same thing, you know. There are persons that are inside, right, and they identify the, um, what is it now, the various groups, the Citizens Association, Farmers Group, and of course some names are up there. What do people like about their community? Little or no crime? Rural location of the community, clean environment, access to natural resources. The community is quiet and, and peaceful. There's free access to the beaches. They speak about employment opportunities at the private gun club. And the community members are cooperative and helpful to one another. What people did not like, similarities across five districts. Unemployment, especially among youth and women. Vulnerability to Oh, sorry, sorry. Vulnerability to natural disasters, flooding, lack of amenities, poor water supply, and lack of recreational facilities. The need for better representation by their member of parliament. So these were some of the things that they expressed that they had real concern with. Then we went to the issue of the Goat Island. Now, of the five groups that we, we interviewed, Two of these groups mentioned Goat Island very early as an issue. However, when we asked about the issue of the Goat Islands, the response was just, <laughs> we, we wondered how it didn't come before, <laughs> you know, but the response when we asked about it was just so much. We had to divide it into different categories of responses. So here are the responses. A few people felt they were not sufficiently informed, so they didn't really have an opinion. Some, a little bit more than a few, believe that the hub is a good economic idea as it will provide employment, yet they had no idea of the kind of jobs they would be able to acquire or what kind of skills they would need. The fisher folk, right off the bat, um, refuted any idea about the sanctuaries being barren of fish. They were also unclear about how much communication existed between various groups. In other words, not just important cottage, but all over Bay. Elshire, some expression suggested competitiveness and maybe fear. Didn't want to go into that. Um, there was also 
concerns about the flooding, increase to the destruction of the mangroves, Ivan's devastation caused the dredging they had mentioned before. Fishermen warned that the new jobs may not be provided and their current livelihoods would be in jeopardy. The construction of the hub would displace fish nurseries and result in widespread unemployment, increased threat to the environment which they, along with Seacam, have worked to preserve. They had been working on this project and they were replanting the mangroves for a few years now. And so they were now beginning to worry, what is going to happen to all of this effort that we are now putting into some of that? And here's a problem tree, some, another tool that we use to get persons to talk and to you know, <coughs> analyze. So they're talking about the Goat Islands, and if you look at it, a large majority here now, oops, cannot see that. A large majority of those interviews felt disrespected. That was the first thing. They said, you are the first people who had come out here and talk to me. In fact, they thought we were bringing information. They didn't realize that they were the experts giving us the information. <laughs> so, you know, they really thought that we, you know, at last somebody come to talk to them, but it had absolutely nothing to do with that. But they were so responsive, you know. A large majority interviewed felt disrespected, expressed sentiments of anger, shame, powerlessness, and were not optimistic about the hope, as they called it. So when we look at the Goat Islands, and what we do is we usually put up a, we tell them to draw a problem tree. The problem tree helps us to, helps the community to um, analyze in terms of causes and consequences. However, we didn't have a cause for this, but what they were to do was to tell us at the bottom of the, the tree, instead of writing root causes, what do you know of the Goat Islands? And you know, what are, how do they describe um, what would happen? And they were talking about flooding, dredging, um, no consideration given to well-being of residents, relocation of fish. So they saw all of that. That is what they associated it with. And then when we said, so what are the Im impacts of that? And they would say, livelihood would be destroyed, inability of the parents to send the children to school, increase in charcoaling, fishermen will have to fish outside, and increase in flooding. And so then, what are your recommendations, we asked. And they said it had, the hub had to be the, the, the idea about Arona Hub or the development of the Goat Islands should really be moved to Jackson Bay. They also felt that if the government goes ahead, it must guarantee job security, attention to proper environmental practices to ensure livelihoods are not compromised. And then we come to the findings. I used um, Matthew Sishman, and Roy. They have several characteristics, and I use the characteristics about communities and building successful communities. And this is what I, I decided to do the analysis on. And so the strengths, awareness of their issues. They were definitely very, oh, it's not there. Okay. Awareness of their issues. All groups were able to identify the critical issues important to them. There was internal motivation. Three active groups, one group willing to act, one present. And that, that group is a Portland Cottage Citizens Association who, all, who is also a member of the PDAC in, in the area, um, in the parish. Port, uh, they, they represent a cross-section of persons. There was internal cohesion in these groups and there was identified leadership and there was evidence of flexibility and ability to discuss and reach consensus. Opportunities, no, sorry, weakness, low level of planning and implementation skills. Solutions to problems were articulated, but there was a lack of understanding of the roles that they would play, in other words, in affecting the desired change. I didn't know the how and the what. Then there was the apathy due to the length of time problems had existed without a resolution. And of course, low social capital, absence of connection to the wider community and external resources needed. Uh, so th this is external to the community and external to other areas and districts in the community. They, 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 there's that sense of uh, uh, challenge in that communicating with other groups out there. Opportunities, openness to developing the skills necessary to address issues. CCAM stated intention of hiring a community development officer. That is an excellent op um, opportunity for them if that happens, and the possibility for social work to play students to facilitate capacity building, which is what we do as part of our um, service, not only service learning, but our 
uh, practicum for our students who must undertake this as part of the degree. And what are the threats? Relatively low capacity to exert significant influence on the state's decision making. Um, the differences of opinion and lack of information about what is proposed makes residents vulnerable to manipulation by vested interests. There's urgent need, and, and the urgent need to move to organization development and community building work to mitigate frustration and apathy and potential for perpetuating sense of powerlessness. So that's a threat if that is not done, because they are really motivated and very seemingly committed at the moment, and we need to you know, move on to the next step. There's also an absence of, of, of an audit of CCAM, which we think is necessary, because we would need to know what is the readiness for this agency to undertake work of this nature. And the recommendations then is, how can we use the findings to facilitate decision making about the next steps within CCAM, between, within the community, within CCAM, between community and CCAM, and the possible next steps I think could include supporting community in voicing concerns and demanding information about the project. And I think encouraging communication between affected groups, there must be others. Portland Bight, Fisher and uh, area between Fisher Folk in Portland Cottage and those in Elsha. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right, what we have heard so far are the impacts that we likely have with developments within the protected areas. What I am looking at this evening are the methodologies that are available to value the impacts of these development projects to the, on the environment. And before we start, we must put these things into a context. Uh, from a development perspective in the sense that the savings that we have in Jamaica is not sufficient to finance to develop the projects that are needed to achieve economic growth in the society. And as such, we have to turn to external sources. That which are available is from mainly the Chinese. And as it is, it seems as if the environmental priority is not one that the Chinese emphasize. It's strictly the bottom line where they are concerned. So the question is, what are we going to do where your protected areas are concerned? Because as it is, these are prime resources that are available for investment purposes. And what we are looking at really and truly is the, is the reality that the investments are coming, the Chinese are coming. What are we going to minimize <laughs> the impact of these particular investments? And how can we recoup from those investments the cost which they have transferred to the society? And that's basically what I'm trying to put forward a methodology to capture. I will go through the background, the summary of the evaluation methodologies and provide a case study from which we can. The background here is that what is the social cost of establishing a development project within these protected areas? Again, the objective is to estimate the, residual val the value of the residual effects of these projects. Yes, what is said by the strict environmentalists is that it will have some impact to the environment. But the question is whether or not it is at that level where it would affect the main functions of the environment because there are some resources there and how much of it can of it should be exploited that is what i think is the way forward for jamaica is not just to conserve conserve without allowing some exploitation the problem statement increased pressure from existing development projects and those within the, the proposed area in this case what we are looking at is the Goat Island transshipment up and that of the 380 megawatt project. Again, what we need here is to establish a criteria that can credibly come to the forefront and 
evaluate these projects, not mainly, because what we find out is that the environmentalists are talking mainly in terms of the impact to the environment, how many fish will, will go on the, the value of the fishing sectors and so on. But there's an inability there to translate that figure into some dollars in which, because as Mr. Omar Davis has said, the, well, over the past couple of months, it's all about the bottom line, which is the dollar figure. And as such, we need to translate the impact into some dollar figure so we can compare as such. So the question that we are looking at here is what is the acceptable trade-off between conservation and development, especially as it relates to the Goat Island area there, because if we conserve, conserve, this is what? 1.5 billion US dollars, can we afford to really turn it back? And that is one of the questions that we need to put forward. And so therefore, what we're looking at here is how can government solve these development issues here and it's going forward? And the question is, can we increase the use of economic analysis facilitated by natural resource valuation to help the government in its decision process where the permit to proceed is seek by these particular projects. The evaluation techniques that are out there are mainly the market oriented ones, uh, the inorganic prices and the travel cost methods. Again, most of the resources that will be impacted, there is no market, so therefore what we'll be looking at is that which is the, from the stated preference approaches, these are the contingent valuation and the choice experiment. The, the literature, they have been published, literature here where the contingent valuation methodology has been applied, especially by that of Peter. And what you find happening here, again, the choice experiment is one that <coughs> I have put in forward here, why? because I think it gives a better value for money than the contingent valuation methodology. Now what I'm putting forward here is a case study. And we're looking at valuing the potential impact of a development project within the Portland by protected area. Again, as the previous presenters have pointed out, the area is very extensive relative to that of the island. It is the largest protected area that we're looking at. And what we're looking at here is the use of a choice experiment to really estimate the short-term and long-term impact of the project. That is, that, and what is the value of the environmental impact that will occur during the short term, which would be the implementation stage, and also during the long run, which would be that of the operation and closure state. That which we have identified generally across the board is that you have noise pollution, air pollution, and some loss of economic services, that is traffic congestion and poor outages, outages during the implementation process. This is actually a report from a study that I have done, but I would not identify. The long run impact, we are looking at the operational phase of the project, and this is during the operation and closure of the project. So basically what we are looking at here are the residual impacts, that which cannot be mitigated out during the, the lifespan of the projects. Therefore, the policy objective where these particular types of development projects is concerned is to reduce the pollution level to some acceptable to some acceptable level, and again, the NEPA guidelines seems to be, well, I wouldn't say sufficient, but that is what we have at the moment, and if it is not sufficient, then it should be upgraded as such. But we, what we have to do is to try and increase the economic activity within the protected area, though facilitating, though facilitating the adherence to the NEPA guidelines, and that is how we will be able to achieve development as it is in our country today. 
And it, they try to experiment, a survey-based type methodology. And we'll just go through the synopsis briefly. The policy issues, will the impacts be above and below the acceptable levels? And that is when compared to that of the NEPA guidelines. And as such, we entered into the Portland by protected area, and we conducted some focus group discussions, and we had, we seek from the community their perspective of the development project, and also in regards to the costs and benefits involved. We established knowledge of the area, proposed project impacts, and so on, explore the resident understanding of the likely impacts, benefits associated with the project. From that, we developed the attribute definition, and this is, would be in regards to the impacts that the particular project would have to the environment as it is. Again, only thing that we need to establish when we talk about impacts, I am by no means an environmentalist from the natural science. But what I'm saying here is that when we talk about a, a car accident, is not necessarily a totaling of the car. You may lose a front wheel, but at the same time, we are able to repair the car and go forward. So where there is scope for some exploitation, it should be facilitated. Again, from the process, we are required to develop a, a status quo from which the persons would compare the likely outcome of the project to that as it is. And again, what we looked at was the monitoring versus no monitoring, and we established those parameters. Again, the sampling firm stratified random potential victims were, were looked at, and from that, we, the, the impact zone was established, and from that, we draw a, a random sample, and again, we will look at the long-term impact because it was given as a public group. We assume that would be, it would have been you know, of national significance, international sample as well. Question here, the attribute levels, we're looking at the marginal effects, the changes, and we established the payment vehicle from the focus group discussion. It was established that the private trust fund was far more efficient than that of the government because of the level of corruption that is within the government, perceived to be within the government agencies. <laughs> the, <laughs> the development of the choice task, what we had to do was to establish what are the, the acceptable level in, and also in regards to the cognitive burden. We have to establish how far, the, how much are the conventional Surveys that the respondents were used was yes, no, and maybe so. When they have to make a choice from a given basket, to compare basket, it, it increased the cognitive burden. So in terms of repeating it, we had to try, try it a couple of times to find out at what stage you would have fatigue and so on, and such limited. The short run policies, again, there was noise exposure, air quality issues, and also loss of services, the policy option was to monitor or not monitor during the construction phase as it is. The long run policy options was, or the attributes that we looked at primarily, land, terrestrial habitat, and we defined it to be equal as it is there. To include that of animal plants within a five kilometer radius of the project site. Plus the biodiversity which would include the plants, birds, trees, etc. Again, this aspect of it was done in collaboration with uh, in-house technical expertise at ISD. The marine habitat and, and the marine habitat was defined as any plants, animals, objects that exist in the body of water extending up to 2,000 meters from the shoreline of the project area. Again, the vulnerability associated with the particular project, our projects were solid waste, sewage, and so on. Air pollution, again, the greenhouse gas emissions was also that which, again, we're looking at relative to 
the NEPA guidelines. Again, the policy, the long run policy option was to monitor versus no monitoring. And what is of importance to remember where NEPA is concerned is the 2010 audit report where it states that NEPA is not functioning at the capacity at, the, at, at which it should be. Again, this is a function of funding. So therefore, what we are looking at is to finance the monitoring, possibility of finance, increased monitoring of these projects within the protected area. Now, for the scenario, what we presented were for a long run trust here. The business as usual, the status quo, is that you do nothing, you pay nothing to have increase. Without, without, this would be as it is now, no monitoring. Option two, let's look at it as a basket. You go downtown, maybe buy a mango, mango orange, and maybe say an apple, and you just vary the quantities and as such. When you look at the prices you pay for each, each, basket, you, you are able to compare the trade-offs and as such, establish the, the relative value for each attribute or each item within the basket. It is the same methodology that we use here. And then the short-run scenario was, and again, the contribution to the trust fund was deemed to be mandatory, and again, Though it is a scenario and hypothetical, we, the, what we have allowed here with the man monitor contribution is to establish with the respondent that what they need to do is to act as if it is a real world situation. Or the, the main findings, short run findings, the vulnerable at attributes all resonate with the Respondents, that is, they care about the air quality, the dust, and so on. Respondents were aware of the composition of the biodiversity within the area. The economic activities within the areas are well known by the respondents, and so on. Respondents were, available, were aware of the trade-offs associated with development. So what we're looking at here, the main respondents were all aware that there is some cost to development. And the question that we have a, that they have put forward is that they, have a, they, they are willing to make some trade-offs here just based upon their response to the surveys. Again, what, they know that they need to minimize the, the greenhouse gas emissions, the protected area, marine environment should be increased in terms of the protection from NEPA and also that of the international standard. Short run, final again, reasons for conservation. Again, high on the list was the habitat function, the amenities, values, like possible camping sites and so on could be established. Regulator, coastal erosion, bequest value, again, as a part of the sustainable thing here is that they need to have access to it so that it can be passed on for their kids also. So what we're seeing here is that though they understand that it should be conserved for this, they all come back down to the dollars and cents and they're all aware of the trade-off that they're going. Econometric findings, the respondents were all willing to pay for increased protection or monitoring of these, protect, of these development projects within the area. All variables considered were welfare improving. Policy option relative to that which is there now increase the welfare of the average person. Willingness to pay to reduce or keep exposure levels within the NEPA guidelines for all variables were significant and positive. Long run finance, consistency of the preference structure for conservation within the PBA between locals and persons living far away. And again, this might say we're all Jamaicans out of many one people. Proponents of the development projects should be forced to adhere to NEPA's environmental guidelines. And again, so what we're looking at here is increased monitoring from NEPA and updating of the, their guidelines so as to enable increased extraction from these areas. 
preservation of ecosystem and ecosystem services were identified identified as one of the main reasons to preserve the areas. People do link the ecosystem service to that of the their well being also. Most and again when we looked at the the responses, most of the respondents were certain of their decisions. The attributes of interest contributed to the welfare of the average person. The design policy options are all seen as welfare improvement that is relative to that which exists now. Policy options geared towards facilitating increased monitoring is seen as a welfare improvement for the average individual. Individuals that face increased vulnerability associated with a major development project are willing to pay to ensure that national standards are not violated and also those who are who are there. Value estimates can be used in cases of, of benefit transfer. The question that arises, will the value of the impacts of these development projects exceed that of the proposed benefits and what we're basically looking at is a cost benefit analysis. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Maurice, um, for that example relating to the, the cost benefit analysis, really, of the development versus the environment. I noted your um, comments about our capacity for monitoring and enforcing standards and the fact that we need more monitoring and greater enforcement. Um, let us see if that will play out as we go forward. Ladies and gentlemen, when we were doing this program, we wanted to leave a, a very healthy block of time for audience interaction with our panelists. So this is now that healthy block of time. Um, timekeeper? Oh, timekeeper. Timekeeper, how much time do we have? For 35 minutes on the program. Yes, and we, oh. can we get that based on your clock? Yeah. yeah. OK. So we can use up our full 35 minutes for discussion, comments, questions, clarifications um, as we go forward, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when you rise to give a comment or to ask a question, please just identify yourself and where you're from and then go right into your question. All right, so who will? Bowl the first ball. My name is Alti and I'm from the Portland Passage Community. Mm -hmm. You said you weren't able to specify or know exactly where. Our region, the Portland by region, will be greatly impacted by that. And you cannot say that the whole boat island and the whole um, um, specific area that you did the interview there. What he is talking about is an exercise that was done which looked at economic evaluation of a development project within the protected, the Portland by protected area, but not the Goat Island. Nobody knows enough about the Goat Island project to be able to do a specific evaluation of the Goat Island project. So what he's doing, or what he did, was look at another project which we have information about, which is probably going to take place because we were contracted by NEPA to do the work. And that project is located in that sort of in that square up there. So, so what I've put forward is a methodology to value only the impact associated, the impact of the development project on the environment and not necessarily a value for the entire environment. And as such, what you find happening here is that the, it will facilitate or can facilitate a cost-benefit analysis at the end of the day. So what I've basically done is, is just to put forward one of many methodologies that are available. When you say value versus valuation, they're two different things, okay? So there's still remaining the economic evaluation, which I thought we were going to talk about. Yes. And I haven't heard word one in terms of what you just said, okay? You can value how much the mangroves, okay? You can value the coral. 
you can value the seagrass. Yes. You can value the forest. Yes. All of these things can be valued. And I was expecting to hear the value of this place, and I haven't heard one, okay? They're economic, there's something called environmental economics. And it can value all of these things. It's been done, okay? So that's what I was waiting to hear. Separately, we're talking about economics as something separate from the environment, okay? You talk about these different capital, okay? All economy is based on the environment, and you're not factoring that economy. Instead, the economy is tourism and manufacturing. The economy is the environment, and you have to factor in those things or you don't have an economy. We did estimate, estimate some values for the attributes, and as in, in the internal legality, of presenting the results here without getting direct permission and not taking a chance. But I can tell you that the guaranteed current the methodology that was used is that flexible as it is. In regards to other studies that was done, we have done I have done studies for the Black River for us and we have estimated values in that which range from US, I think it's about US eight dollars that we have looked at in terms of contributing to the to the to a conservation fund for that particular area. So what I'm basically saying here is that the the projects that are implemented in the in these protected areas what we need to do is to look at what are the impacts and delineate such impacts and as such value the impacts and weigh them against the overall benefit. I would like to say that, for instance, there has been through the World Resources Institute a study called Coastal Capital. And the Coastal Capital study did focus on the South Coast and in particular in the Portland by its old harbor, that strip. And there were values placed on the fish stock, the seagrass yes. beds, coral reefs, shoreline protection, yes. all of those things a value was placed and it included a number of subsidiary studies that they put together and they have values. Um, I know that Dr. Kurt McLaren out of Life Sciences is beginning to do some work on assessing like seagrass coverage and looking at the value to be had from carbon sequestration, carbon trading um, from sequestered carbon in the forest, seagrass areas, mangroves around the area. So there is, has been and there is work coming forth to give us that kind of intrinsic natural resource value, not just the choice experiment which speaks to the value people place on the environment, but the environment's value intrinsically. And given that we had to look at the pros and cons of that from an economic point of view, what he's doing is explaining what he did in that particular case. When time comes that somebody actually has enough information on goat islands, the same method, the same thing that he did, would be applied to the goat island. But what he's saying is basically this. For that particular project, what we did was we looked at people in the area who are likely to be affected and ask them, if this takes place and you're likely to be affected, would you be willing to put any money into a non-government fund to increase NEPA's ability to monitor and to take care of things? And the findings were that pretty much everybody was concerned about the short-term and long-term impacts. People were willing to put money into such a fund and people felt, as you said in the short term and long term, that any development project, even one which had a great benefit, must be held to adhere to the NEPA guidelines and all the other things that you said. So this is not a, this is an example of work that could be done, but not a evaluation of what Goat Island is going to do. You would have to wait until enough information is there. But what he's saying is for this particular project, which is an industrial type of project, 
this work has been done for a part of the Portland Bight, and what we found was that people indeed do actually value the environment and want, it, even with the development to be done, which would benefit much of Jamaica, they still want the environment to be taken care of and that people are willing to pay to have that done. The methodology that was presented here is one which is not um, necessarily uh, recognized as a foolproof methodology. Certainly there are a huge set of assumptions which are made in the processes of trying to use economic principles to guide valuation of, of environmental resources. Um, just to give you two, two critical limitations. One is a problem of information and knowledge. There's, a, there's an assumption that the agents know enough to be able to make a trade-off so that they can actually be able to give a correct valuation. But we are subject to preferences. It could be, my guess, as good as yours. The second element of it is willingness to pay. There are a number of debates within economics whether or not we are going to use monetization as a mechanism for valuation. Um, there's a coin, a, a phrase that says, the, the economist knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. So that there is a very important plus of the debate within economics as to whether or not we can use market prices, and we're not even using market prices. We're using hedonistic prices in order to try and give certain kinds of evaluations upon which fundamental decisions which have irreversible consequences will be made. So that methodological principles upon which these decisions have to be made need to be evaluated. One assumption, again, of the trade-offs that are existing between different options. What am I willing to bear as an individual in levels of pollution? It assumes that people have clear preferences and that you can wrap them in this kind of continuous way. There are some people, for example, Ina says, no, no, no to Gold Island. So what she has in economic terms is a lexicographic preference. In other words, I have a certain priority. I have a certain set of things that I value that I am not willing to trade off. I am not willing to, to engage in an exchange relationship in which to get something else. Mm -hmm. If the agents have preferences which are kinked, which are in this characteristic, you cannot use this methodology. You have to assume that you have continuous preferences in which you have this capacity to trade off in order for the methodology to work. If the preferences are not such, you have imposed a reality upon the world and then extracted information which is not true. So the first step is really to assess whether or not the fundamental basis of these decisions that are being made are guided by some rational decision making which can be validated. And in my understanding as an economist, as someone who has studied this and has taught this, these are controversial issues within economics and we need to have alternative methodological approaches in order to be able to see option A using method one, option B using an alternative methodology which does not take the same <coughs> assumptions for granted in the approach. So this is something that I think we need to bear in mind before we go off trying to assess what is the value for this particular approach. It is one, what we have to be careful of. We emphasize in the first presentation appropriate principles of decision making. The assumption here that we have weak substitutability, if we run out of these things, we have money capital, we have something else. A number of examples have shown that when you lose the money capital, for example, you go bust in a financial market crash, you still don't have the environment. You cannot bring it back. So that there are lose-lose scenarios, even when you accumulate funds from like a trust fund, even when you accumulate funds in your audit track, that money can disappear. If it has disappeared, what are you going to do? You have no environment and you have no money. So this is this is a weakness of a principle of weak sustainability, which is why we introduce the concept of strong sustainability, where we say that there are complementarities, not substitutability, not infinite substitutability between one thing and the next, but there's a there's a limit to how much I can consume a particular asset and get away with it. Why? Because I depend on that asset for my life, my survival, my economic capacity, <laughs> my productive capacity. So these are issues that we need to be fully aware of. Let's not jump into a critique 
of the, the numbers that are coming out here, let us assess the foundations upon which we're making our decisions.